This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Big thank you to Tom Vecchio for filling in for me the past couple of days while I was out for my wife's PhD graduation. Tom always does a fantastic job, so I know you all were in good hands for those couple of days, and I am delighted to be back here for today because we've got the matchup set for the conference finals in the NBA and also golf's second major, the PGA Championship, coming up on Thursday. Here to break down both those is Brandon Gandula. We're going to pick his brain on both game ones and also preview this year's pga championship welcome on into covering the spread that's right here on the fanduel podcast network and numberfire.com my name is jim sonis i am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire joined here as mentioned by brandon gadula check him out on twitter at gadula 13 find his work over at numberfire.com and brandon i know we've referenced this before we made jokes before about how you come on the show wouldn't be on the next week, and the next week is the, the, the week you hit the winner. But now, with you being in the show every week, we've ruined that streak, and suddenly you're hitting winners uh, with Jason Day, 17-1, to 1, being the winner this past week. So do we have to have you on the show every day? Is that the next step in this? Uh, what's, uh, what's going on here? Because it seems like the mojo is flowing. Jim, I, lo- I love being on. I love talking about this stuff, but please don't ask me to do this every day. I'm asking you to do that right now. Why do you not want the people to win money? Why are you against the people? Why not, are you why are you in big, big corporate's pocket, Brandon? I mean, look, when I when I get asked to do this show, I spend a lot of time uh, digging in, making notes because I want to give uh, good recommendations. And even whenever things inevitably don't work out, you know, some of the time. Uh, I at least want to have a good rationale. So it's it's a time consuming process. And I think for my own sake, uh, I've learned the power of saying no. Mm -hmm. Yet I say yes to this, you know, every week. I've been the one encouraging you to say no to things. Um, however, I am mad that you have decided to deprive the people of your good thoughts. So we're fighting now. We're officially feuding. Um, so this this might be a rocky Just podcast, now. but we're still going to. Yeah, first time that this has ever happened, right? Uh, we're still going to talk to Brandon, I guess, while he's here about some NBA. We'll talk to PGA Championship, get you ready for all of that here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast, because we got shows coming up every day this week and also over on the FanDuel YouTube page. So subscribe there if you like what you hear. Leave us a thumbs up over on YouTube or leave us a five-star rating over on Apple Podcasts. Are you looking to have a stake in the PGA Championship all weekend, not just with your bets, but also with Daily Fantasy? Well, FanDuel has you covered with the PGA Mega Eagle Contest, which is now live. Test your knowledge of the PGA Tour by putting together a six-person lineup while staying under the salary cap and using FanDuel's live scoring feature. Follow along as you compete for a share of $350,000 with first place taking home 100 k all for just $9 in the entry fee. Whether it's household names like John Rahm, Justin Thomas, or lesser-known golfers you think could make a name for themselves this weekend, the tee-off time is on Thursday. So there are plenty of options for you to fill out your lineups as you compete for first place. Thursday will be here before you know it, so submit your lineups on FanDuel today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app for more details. We're going to get things off for today by talking about the NBA. We're going to go through both game ones in the Eastern and Western Conference because no NBA talk on the show for tomorrow talking about the Preakness instead then. So let's begin things off with the first conference championship game one. That is the Lakers at the Nuggets in the West. That is coming up tonight. We got uh, the spread here as the Nuggets as six-point favorites. Total is 222.5. And, and Brandon, your numbers were high in the Lakers for most of their series with the Warriors there, and obviously they got the win in that series, but now facing the Nuggets. And there's six-point dogs here. The The Lakers love paid off there. What are you seeing here relative to the market for game one against the Nuggets? Yeah, kind of viewing the uh, Lakers similarly, where I like them. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the process, even though, as Jim mentioned, I'm on the show every week, Um you know, I I look only at relevant splits for teams based on who is healthy and who's in the lineup. This team, uh, this Lakers team, is just a lot different. 
when they have, unsurprisingly, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and D'Angelo Russell all playing together. In that split, uh, they're 16 and 5 overall, which is not a whole lot of games. Um, that obviously that sample is growing, but uh, it's you know it's a it's a better sample to be looking at than a full season thing or you know any sort of arbitrary cutoff otherwise. Uh, they're 14 and seven against the spread in that split as well. Um, now the Nuggets, to their credit, are unsurprisingly great with Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray. Murray is questionable um, with an illness. I have not been able to confirm <laughs> like how serious that is. I'm assuming that he is going to play. Now, frankly, yes, they're better with, with Jamal Murray. Uh, it's about two points per 100 possessions of a difference. So long as the constant is that Jokic is, is playing, not even that he's just on the court, but just that he's active. Um, he is the he's the true difference maker. So yes, that is that is a, a, a fairly substantial number. Uh, if this were the regular season, I would take a wait and see approach and see if I you know still wanted to go that way. But whenever uh, someone's questionable, I still run the numbers, and then if I see any value on a particular uh, side that is only going to benefit from the news that like that player is out then I like it and I'm good with it. And that's what I'm seeing here uh, on the Lakers. Um, I can see here you have the, uh, the, the the betting stats pulled up and it looks like a lot of uh, interesting trends here on the difference between the percentage of money on the spread and the percentage of the bets on the spread, uh, the, the money favoring the nuggets here. But you know, for my model, assuming Murray plays, the spread should be um, four and a half in Denver favor, which leaves a point and a half for the Lakers. So I'm, I'm interested in the Lakers spread, just like I was game one for their series against the Warriors. Jim, I said, I see the case for the money line back uh, against the Warriors. And you were much more willing to take that on. Uh, I do see slight money line value on them, even with Jamal Murray active. Uh, the, the, the reality is just that Denver is fantastic. You know, we know they're playing at home, but the Lakers have just been a really good team. I always, again, just sort of prefer going with the spread here, but uh, the money line is certainly in play as well. Uh, the money line right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, plus 198 on the Lakers. Uh, the spread is plus six and minus 108 there. So it sounds like for you, based on – the way you're seeing things, the better value here is in the spread at plus six versus the money line at plus one at one ninety eight. Is that correct? Yeah, um, that is that is correct. And just from a personal preference, uh, if I can get an underdog with just taking the points at yeah. you know relatively uh, you know odds around you know minus one ten, that's just ten tends to be what I prefer because I'm a very pessimistic person by nature. And so for an underdog to win, I feel like is less likely than what my own data shows. That's just, uh, that's my own personality and my own internal biases that I try to work through. Out of curiosity, are you willing to yeah. disclose the win odds you have for the Lakers here? Um, if you're not, that's okay. I'm just curious. I'm help, trying so to decide for myself if I want to take the money line or the spread. What would you need it to be? Uh, so the implied odds at two to one are 33%. If it were 36% or higher, I would take the money line. It's 36.7, which implies basically plus 172, plus 173 in that range. Okay. We're in the money line. We're doing it again. So. Running it back. What could possibly go wrong? Brandon's official recommendation is the Lakers plus six and minus 108. But if you are not a coward, plus 198 on the money line <laughs> uh, for the Lakers here against the Nuggets. If you're not going to come on every day, I'm, I'm taking full freeway to just roast you, um, even when you're providing good data. You know, hey, usually roast that... for bad things. But hey, you know, our podcast, our rules, right? Like I said, I come on here. I try to say what I see in the data. Uh, and from there, you know, I can't tell anyone to do anything or not do anything. So 
Correct. Always gamble within your means. Always gamble yeah. responsibly, and you know, use the data to decide where you want to go. For me personally, I'll go money line at plus one ninety eight. Brandon likes the spread at plus six. Game one in the Eastern Conference is the Heat and the Celtics. That spread right now is the Celtics minus eight. Total here is two ten point five. And Brandon Jimmy Butler keeps on doing the dang thing. Keeps on pushing the Heat through the playoffs. He's gotten them now to the Eastern Conference Finals, but it's a matchup with the Celtics. Celtics are tough. They've had some tough tests already. They knocked off the Bucks and stuff like that. The Knicks as well. Can the Heat keep it rolling? What's your read on Game 1 here in the Eastern Conference? So this one's kind of interesting because I, I ran this game with – I basically have like – bookmarked splits for teams that I use. And then I just tweak it from there. It saves me time. And I ran it without thinking because I was, you know, Oh, the heat, nothing new here um, in terms of injury. And then it's like, Oh, but I still have it where Tyler hero is active. And they got some weird splits with Mm -hmm. Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo and Tyler hero where they have a winning record, but the net rating is like a slight negative. And so I reran it with, with Butler and Bam active, but Hero completely inactive, and they're they've been better in terms <laughs> of net rating. Uh, so I initially had this spread at I think like eleven point three in Boston's mm-hmm. favor, and then once I reran it, it is now like seven point eight. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it's really interesting, and that's why sometimes you can't just always assume players out team is worse i'm not saying anything against tyler hero it just sort of is you know maybe something structurally uh with the team who's who's playing more the way that they're playing anything like that plus this team has just been really locked in and sort of overly efficient in this a lot of this spread where where hero has been out for the playoffs so you know it it is it, it is kind of a strange one uh, and that sample now of those games with Hero completely out uh, is over 1,500 possessions. So I think that's a pretty stable number there. So the spread I thought was going to be in Boston's favor. And now I think it's too close uh, for me to want to get to. As for Boston themselves, we know with Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown active, they're really good. Uh, so the thing that my model is jumping jumping on is actually the over. Um, I've, I, I saw this total first at 211. I don't know if that was exactly where it opened, but it's down half a point. And so I'm actually viewing it the other way. Uh, I know it always feels hard to love the overs with the heat, but they've been hitting overs in the playoff a lot more than people realize. They have some good offense. Boston can definitely uh, light it up. And, you know, we've seen, you know, frankly, we've seen Miami play some teams that are not fantastic offenses. Uh, in the playoffs, you know, with, with Giannis out like that whole, that whole for, you know, a good portion of the early part of that series, uh, Milwaukee was like a subpar offense, New York, not necessarily, like, I mean, they've, they've had good offensive splits, but they were, they just looked completely lost and were missing. It seemed like every shot that they had in, in that, in that series. So for me, I think the over uh, makes sense. I have this one going over um, pretty comfortably, my total here is uh, 217. So it's important to remember that the market is accounting for heat having typically low totals. Your numbers are accounting for that as well. So I know that like the sentiment is, you know, they tend to have lower scoring games, but the market is reflecting that with the total being yeah. 210.5. And also, I think based on what you are running, that split with no hero, with Jimmy and with Bam being active, a lot of that probably comes from this postseason run. Um, which implies to me that the spread with the Celtics here by 7.8 is accounting for the fact that Butler is an alien. And it, it seems to me that should lower the fear a bit of the situation. Again, it, it implies a no bet, but it also to me lowers the fear of, okay, I'm not missing out on the heat plus eight here because that's accounted for in the numbers. Yeah. I have them uh, going over in 66.7 percent of the games in that split without hero so like yeah. again it goes back to just because player players out doesn't mean the team's worse and just because you know good offensive players out doesn't mean you bet the under because right. the under is reflected in that so 
yeah, I think that this offense uh, and maybe their defense too has been a little bit surprisingly over friendly, even though it doesn't feel that way. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So the two bets Brandon likes for the two game ones are the Lakers plus six and then the Heat Celtics over 210 and a half. Uh, the number on that is minus 110 right now. Let's shift gears here and talk about the PGA Championship coming up this week. It is the golf's second major of the year out at Oak Hill Country Club in Rochester, New York. And it's not hosted the event since 2013. So, Brandon, what should we know about this course before filling out some bets for this weekend? Yeah, it's always tough whenever we don't have a lot of data to go off of with the course. I mean, this has hosted a few times, 2013, as you mentioned, 2003 as well. But, you know, frankly, no shot link data, and that's tough. Um, PGAs, I think, also just generally play harder than people realize. They play a little bit more like a U.S. Open. Uh, I, the winning score was 10 under in 2013 and 4 under in 2003 at this particular course and it's it's just kind of tough and what makes it tough is that it's pretty pretty long for a par 70 and for me one thing that really really stands out is the average green size at 4500 square feet uh pga tour averages around 6,000 square feet so these are definitely smaller greens um and with the added length for the par 70 smaller greens then just almost in literally any, every case, always. It's better to be long off the tee than it is to be short off the tee, and you need to have good irons to hit these smaller greens and hold them. Um, now, with with that being said, I've been you know digging into, and I try not to do this too much because I, I find that it tends to be more misleading than anything, and I know this is probably a big part of people's process, but like listening to what the pros are saying about the course mm -hmm. once they get there and, you know, Every time there's a U.S. Open, it's like, oh, drop the ball an inch off the fairway, and yeah. need, I need a shovel to get it out, basically. And that stuff is not how it plays always. So, you know, it, it's just kind of uh, one thing that I find to be a little bit more harmful than anything. But one of the things that I've really heard the pros saying is that the the rough itself is really different. It's like really thick blades of grass, and so. Uh, I think it was Max Homa, Justin Thomas, basically saying it's better to, uh, that would make sense because I was listening to the No Lang Up podcast. And so <laughs> those, those guys are basically part of the No Lang Up crew at this point. But, um, you know, they're saying it's, it's going to be beneficial to be hitting fairways. Mm -hmm. And while that's always the case, uh, I feel like whenever we hear, oh, you got to hit these fairways, and it's good to be long, but if you're long and in, in, in the rough, you're you know in a in a bad spot, and then it doesn't always end up that way, and it tends to tends to be just whoever's hitting it farther. So I'm just giving that information out there. I'm not doing a ton with it to say, oh, I need right, I need to downplay distance and just really look at driving accuracy. Uh, point being is there's not a whole lot to go off of that we can say with certainty. What we can say is that it's a major, majors especially the PGAs are always all around tests. Small greens, so better iron play is going to mean you can gain greens on the field. Uh, but also with small greens, you're inevitably going to miss them. If there is tricky rough and tricky lies around the green, you got to be able to have those good, you know, get the ability to get up and down, have good wedges. So I just basically said we need distance or accuracy off the tee. We need good irons. We need good wedges. And of course you need the putter. So basically what it comes down to is you need to have everything this week. And that's right. pretty much how I play every major. And when you're talking about guys who have everything that right now seems to mostly pertain to John Rahm and Scotty Scheffler. They're the co-favorites of FanDuel Sportsbook. They're plus 750 right now before I dip down to Rory McIlroy 13 to one. And those are short numbers. Um, but as we've seen recently, Brandon, even in these elevated fields, we've seen value in some of the favorites at times. So a short number does not mean a golfer is not a value. When you look at those favorites right now at their current numbers, any value for them for you right now? Yeah, short numbers don't always mean that they're bad values. Um, just like I said, the, the things about like the NBA not always being what you what you first think. And for me, honestly... I would not put Scotty Scheffler in the complete does everything well right now because the putter is a bit iffy. Uh, so for me, it's John Rahm is the only one who hits all those boxes. And I do have John Rahm as a slight value. Um, 
I have at 12.9%, which means about plus 675 as Wednesday value is value. Um, so I'm not going to hate anyone who wants uh, to go at John Rahm at plus 750. He's got two majors uh, to his name now. He's probably, I don't really know how you'd argue he's not the most complete golfer right now, especially with Scheffler uh, and his putting concerns with Rory just not quite being Rory. Speaking of which, Rory's not rating out very well for me. Uh, he's kind of cooled off a bit, hasn't played a lot lately. I would not be super surprised if Rory came out and played well, but I don't know if this is necessarily the place I would think to pick Rory where he's got to grind out hole after hole. But I know he's got that in him. I just don't, I, you know, do you, we don't see it often over 72 holes. So among the favorites, uh, Rom is a value according to the model. And I know that if you want to bet him, you got to figure out how that impacts the rest of your card. Uh, I'm aware of that. Are you taking Rom yourself or no? So I'm very interested in it. Yeah. But there's a trio and really a duo right behind, like in the second tier. Mm -hmm. And so I got to figure out what my process is. Uh, so basically of, weighing what the better value is, whether that's taking Rom at plus 750 or relying on some guys with some longer odds and potentially having more outright bets out there. Yes. Yes. That's okay. that's what it comes down to. Okay. So Rom I will is decide. A value I will on, decide here. Yeah. But I'll talk about the other outrights I'm interested in and then we can go from there. Okay. So Rom is a value plus 750. I trust the model, even though you don't. Uh, so I think that Rom makes a lot of sense at plus 750. So the guys you're weighing right now, beyond John Rama plus 750, which other outrights show value to you at FanDuel at the moment? Shocker. <laughs> Xander Shavale. Um, I have him at 15 to 1. He is 17 to 1 on FanDuel Sportsbook. He was 24 to 1, um, which is a pretty drastic swing, uh, pretty much overnight from 24 to 17. He just does everything well, which is, again, what I'm looking for. Uh, the price is good. He's got four straight top 15s in his past four majors. You know, the only thing you can really knock with Sander is that he, quote unquote, doesn't win. But I think people who would say that are maybe like overstating what, how much you can control winning a golf tournament. Like, it's not just, it's not just up to you. Um, I also like his buddy, Jim. Uh, Patrick Cantlay mm. at I have him at 18 to one. He is 20 to one on FanDuel Sportsbook. He's another golfer who does everything well. He is starting to play a lot better in uh, majors. He's got three straight top 15s at majors 14th at the U S open last year. Uh, T eight at the open and then uh, T 14 at the masters this year. Why not putting particularly well? So there's two names in the mid range there. And then one name who uh, we probably haven't talked about a lot lately, but he's got some majors to his name as well. If we think that we need golfers who hit fairways and have really, really good iron play, I see him on your screen there. I bet you can kind of figure out who it is. Nope, scroll past them already. Ah, oh, dang it. Accurate, great irons, majors okay. to his name. Yeah, yeah. Call him Morikawa. Uh, 34 to 1. He's not golfing particularly well uh, in terms of the putting. But if you pull up whatever your preference of choice is in terms of, you know, event logs, you'll see that he is striping the irons. Uh, we know that he's accurate. So I think that I think what it's coming down to for me is pretty much like Rom plus Morikawa is my, just my two main main outrights or Xander and Cantlay. And the more I talk about it, the more I feel like John Rom's going to win. So I will say that I will, I'm betting John Rom this week, even if it means I'm overlooking that second tier. And once I get down into the 34 to one range, I can jump back in. Yeah. I think for me, I, if I'm structuring this the way I think about it from a NASCAR perspective, which I know is not totally analogous to golf, but it's kind of somewhere in the way the odds are structured. If I have a, 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 a driver, a plus 750 outright, I'd be okay adding one guy in the mid range, whether it be Xander or Cantlay. I'm going to guess you're going to go Xander personally. Yeah. Uh, but then I'd also be okay with more at 34 to one, three outrights in like three separate tiers, I think is okay. It's the fourth one might be where I would, 
well, I would be a little bit more yeah. nervous, but it sounds like you're on the same page here where you're okay taking one from each tier and filling things out that way. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a, probably a math, like, I mean, there's a mathematical way to approach it. There's also, you might think like, so yeah, we, we know like you need to have the right return to mm -hmm. make it worthwhile. If you just bet everyone, you will have a bad time, right? We like, we know that, but <laughs> Let's say I had Colin Morikawa at something outrageous like fifteen to one. Yeah, should I not bet him just because I already bet John Rom and like I don't want to bet too many people? Like, if you have like three or four great values and you see no value on anyone else, that also changes things. Yeah, like so uh, there, there's basically not like a one size fits all answer when it comes to this stuff. So uh, it's just something you you kind of have to learn on your own and figure out what works for you. Um, while being smart uh, from there. So the values based on the model are John Rom plus 750, Xander Schauffele 17 to 1, Patrick Cantley 20 to 1, Colin Morikawa 34 to 1. You can kind of decide which of those guys you like most. If you want to go all four, I think that's at least justifiable. Not my personal preference, but, uh, you know, do whatever makes you happy. I wouldn't do that personally, but yeah. um, I think it sounds like you want to settle on Rom, Xander, and Morikawa, correct? Yep. Okay, let's focus now on the non-outrights. And we've got 16,000 markets already posted <laughs> for this. Uh, looking at the non-outrights, which ones to you are the best values? Uh, I got a top 10, uh, Tony Finau, which... Top 10 Tony. Yeah, uh, he's plus 210 uh, to top 10. Uh, he's cooled off a bit in majors, but not substantially so. The putter being improved and fixed means that he has effectively no weaknesses in his game. Uh, so my model sees value in him in the top 10 market specifically. Um, he's an even value in the outright market, but you know, with for, for my model with Scheffler and Rory pretty heavily overvalued at the top, that makes that second tier really appealing. And I don't want to ignore that just because I have interest in John Rom. I think that's the wrong way uh, to go about it. Uh, I'm usually not in the head to head game. Oh, I don't want to be jumping you all around, but Sung JM minus 118 over Tiro Hatton. I think this course suits both of them pretty well. Hatton tends to play well at tougher setups, but for Sung Jae, he should be in play off the tee. And then he has good irons from there and just a good combined short game. So I think this is a good spot uh, for Sung JM to be in somewhat uh, contention. Uh, and then jumping into groups, I got three groups I like. Love groups, uh, especially in majors. It just makes it a lot more fun, uh, especially um, early on in the tournament before you can get too excited about your your outrights. And, and again, just because someone's top top five after day one does not mean he won the tournament. Um, so just just be you know be mindful of that. But subtweet uh, <laughs> Sung J M plus two fifteen in Group D over Matt Fitzpatrick, Tiro Hatton, and Cam Smith. Again, laid out the case for why I think Sung JM can play well here. Um, that's nice. Uh, Jason Day, Group C, over Cameron Young, Victor Hovland, Dustin Johnson. It's basically just a medley of ball strikers there, but Day's in great form, as we've talked about. It's a good number. Uh, he's also uh, a good play for top Aussie. I didn't jot down what his uh, odds were there, but... Um, I saw value in that. And then last one, going back to a play I like, Colin Morikawa, Group E over uh, Jordan Spieth, who is not, he's very far from 100%, it sounds like. Max Homa, who's playing well in major, like playing better in majors, uh, and Sam Burns, who I'm never quite as sold on uh, as I used to be with him. So uh, I think those three groups, specifically with Day, Sung Jay, and Morikawa, uh, I'd feel really good with tracking that throughout the tournament. With the Morikawa, the group that is plus 220 over Speed, Homa, and Burns, do you like that more than the outright for Morikawa? If you had to pick one, which one would you lean towards if you had to guess? I mean, I'm, I don't want to pass up a 34 to 1 number on someone who can play at a you know world-class level like Morikawa. So. And I think the other pitch you're going with the outright is that if your model views... Scheffler, McElroy, guys like that as being a bit overvalued, that the actual like value in that number at 34 to one is likely better than the actual value at plus 220th in the group bet. Yeah. I mean, look, my model, it just sees certain golfers as like 
overvalued and that has a trickle down effect on the rest of the odds. I think a lot of the live guys are shorter than they should be because of the, what they did at the masters Mm -hmm. and that's all impacted. So like, you know, sometimes I I recommend a couple top, like multiple top 10 bets. And it's not because I think all of these guys will finish in the top 10. It's just that there's individual value on them. Right. Because other golfers are substantially overvalued. Right. And I think I've kind of seen that with the live guys too. It makes sense given what happened at the masters where they were super competitive and stuff like that. But some of them, if you look at their form on the live tour, might be a bit overvalued based on what they're doing right now. So uh, the group bets, as Brandon mentioned, in addition to Tony Finau, top 10 at plus 210, Sung J M minus 118 over Tyrrell Hatton as well. Sung J, uh, he had a week between the PGA Championship and the Wells Fargo where he, you know, eighth season, good form. He went back to Korea and there and then won. No rest for Sung JM. I don't think his body would allow him to take a week off, but apparently he is just uh, going out there, winning tourneys, you know, snatching trophies. That's what Sung JM does. That's going to wrap it up for Brandon Gandula for today. Check him out on Twitter at Gandula13. If you want his full PGA Sims, go over to numberfire.com. And Brandon, I'll talk to you later on today to talk some DFS for the PGA Championship, too. Thank you, as always, for swinging by. Yeah, thanks for having me, as always. All righty, we'll see if Brandon can hit another outright once again this week after having Jason Day last week and just hitting a, an overall good stretch here with his recommendations here on the show. Before we wrap up for today, got to go back through last week's recommendations here on the show. And of course, that does start with Brandon recommending Jason Day 17 to 1 for last week's event, the AT&T Byron Nelson uh, Day golfed pretty well the entire weekend and did eventually climb his way to the top of the leaderboard. Pretty tough field there too, because Scotty Scheffler was in contention, other pretty solid golfer. Siwoo Kim was there, but Jason Day does get the win at 17 to one. Other outrights for Brandon were on Taylor Montgomery at 46 to one, Tom Hoagie at 50 to one. Also top 10 to those guys, uh, plus 410 for Montgomery, plus 450 for Tom Hoagie. Those didn't hit, but uh, Day did uh, once again. Other top 10s so for Brandon were Tom Kim, plus 210. Adam Hadwin at plus 500. They both tied for 34th in last week's event. Final one was Dylan Wu, top 20 at plus 410. Wu missed a cut. But again, with the day outright at 17 to 1, should have been a good week for all of you and uh, should have covered all those other recommendations. So good week by Brandon once again on the PGA side of things. The UCL semifinals were last week. We had talked about those two weeks ago with Austin Cass. You can find him on Twitter at Austin Cass. And Austin, one and one of the UCL recommendations. First one was Man City over Real Madrid at plus 110. They drew in their semifinal. That was in a, a in a market that did include the draw as a as a potential bet. Hit was Inter over AC Milan at minus 120. That was in the tie no bet market. Uh, uh, Inter won that one pretty handily. 2-0, they were up. Uh, they scored both those goals before the 12th minute, able to coast from then on. So good hit by Austin there. 1-1 one one overall in the week. More APL talk coming up on Friday via Austin with only a couple weeks left here in the EPL this season. I had an okay week on the NASCAR side of things. Starting the truck race on Friday, I liked William Byron to win at plus 250. Byron finished fourth, so no dice on that one. But uh, the top fives were Stuart Friesen at plus 450 and Christian Eckes, or sorry, Parker Kligerman at five to one. Friesen finished runner up. Uh, so the top five bet did cash at plus 450. Christian Eckes won the race. Kligerman had a mechanical issue, did not finish. So no win there, but uh, a profit via Friesen at plus 450. In Xfinity, I had outrights on Kyle Larson at 2-1, to one, Austin Hill 28-1. to one. Larson got a speeding penalty with about 40 or 50 laps left, went back to 30th, and got some help via well-timed cautions, but he got to the front, and he passed John Hunter Nemechek on the last lap for the win, some contact there, so Nemechek did wind up wrecking, but um, Larson able to get the win there despite a speeding penalty, which is always a good feeling to win, even when things may not entirely go your way. Obviously, if Larson won, Hill did not win, but he finished fourth. Uh, I liked him top five. Uh, plus C75, mentioned that on the show as well. So Larson, the winner, two to one. Hill top five, plus 375. Uh, the other top fives that did not hit were Chandler Smith at plus 275, Brandon Jones at plus 375, and Daniel Hemrick at plus 750. And in Cup, uh, the one recommendation here on the show never came close. That was Corey LaJoy top 10 at 11 to one. LaJoy, okay speed in practice. 
issue in qualifying, and then he was pathetic during the race. Just really, really bad. So never came close on that one. William Byron was added to the betting guide over a number fire after qualifying a plus 850. So again, I'd encourage you to check out those over on number fire to add weekend bets because I can't do the show here after qualifying. Uh, hopefully you're able to find that betting guide over at number fire and get the Byron outright at plus 850 for the cup series race, but no dice in the one here mentioned the show, but still via the Larson win and Xfinity, uh, the top five on Freeson, the Hill top five, nice weekend overall on the racing side of things. More racing thoughts coming up on Thursday because we've got the all-star race this weekend. We've got F1 uh, in Imola, I believe. And uh, we also have the truck series race at uh, North Wilkesboro all coming up this weekend. We'll talk about that coming up on Thursday. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the Preakness. We're going to have Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV on once again to get her thoughts on the second leg of the Triple Crown. To get that right as it is posted, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts and check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Big thank you once again to Brandon Gandula. Check him out on Twitter at Gandula13. Find his PGA Sims over at numberfire.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanis, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets in the NBA for tonight, the PGA this weekend. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down the Preakness. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Podcast Network.